So back in part one, we found these SCSI pass-through commands in the software that came with this weird little USB recorder. And we know at least this uh, provides some way to set the time, but uh, there are probably you know, some other things going on here, including something for firmware updates. And then Mike in the comments uh, for Mike's electric stuff pointed out something that might be even easier, that maybe if we just read um, past the end of the storage, we might just start getting firmware data without even having to bother with the uh, special SCSI commands. So I thought that might be fun to try out. And in particular, I think there might be a really quick way to do that by slightly hacking the software that I built originally for Coaster Melt. A lot of this is going to be focused around um, talking to a little firmware backdoor that uh, gives us a way to specifically read and write memory. But the shell that I wrote for Coaster Melt does include a lower level scripting interface just for sending SCSI commands and um, you know reading from the disk. So if we can just use that um, for this device, that might be a really quick way to see what's going on. Most of this Coaster Melt code is written in Python, but there's a little C++ module for the low-level SCSI communication, because that seemed to be the easiest way to do it at the time. I wrote this little tiny wrapper around um, the Mac OS uh, low-level SCSI interface, and it just takes a USB product and vendor ID in order to find the right device. This is another layer of the Coaster Melt software. This time it adds functions uh, specific to that MT1939 chip we found. And really the proper thing to do would be to make another layer um, in parallel to this one. But just for testing, I'm going to modify this so that we can have the Coaster Melt software uh, connect to a different device. So I can just copy the vendor and product ID from what we see in USB Prober here. All right, and now I'll just rebuild Coaster Melt. All right, unmount the disk. Disk unmounted. Still filled open SCSI device. No device found for 10D61101. Am I still seeing it? 10D61101. Well, I guess we'll have to go deeper into what that um, no device found is actually indicating. This is how macOS tries to locate USB devices. Um, it has this. Um, you know, most OSs have some notion of like a tree of what devices are attached, and in macOS, these are I.O. services. This MMC user client is something that might actually be um, specific to CD-ROMs, which is a problem here. Yeah, this authoring device thing worked for Coaster Melt, but it wouldn't work for this device. It might not be as straightforward as I thought to modify this uh, Coaster Melt tiny SCSI library to talk to um, this USB disk recorder device. I was relying on this MMC device interface, which is actually specific to optical drives. So actually, I think there might be an easier approach. Um, I'm going to switch tactics. This is something I wrote a long time ago. I don't even remember where the latest copy of this would be. Oh, it's still in NaviMisc. This is something I wrote a long time ago when I was having trouble with some misbehaving USB hard drives. And they were having this problem where it would hit a bad sector, and the hard disk would malfunction in some way that was so severe that it would kind of take down the Linux kernel with it. So my solution at the time was to write this weird little USB um, storage um, utility in user space. So this was just a little command line program you could run at the time, and it would just try its darndest to get every sector that it could off of that disk without giving up. But as a result, it's kind of a nice little self-contained doodad that speaks um, the USB storage protocol um, completely over LibUSB. <laughs> That's right. This never worked on Mac OS. This was like a Linux thing. Let's see if it actually needs that SCSI header. Yay. Grumpy Disk is a data recovery program for damaged or otherwise failing slash flailing USB storage disks. Already unmounted. Yeah, I didn't think this was like a root permission thing, but like a driver permission thing. I think the problem we're running into is actually a security feature in macOS that um, prevents one driver from attaching to a device while another driver is using it. So actually, I think at this point I'm going to give up on running Grumpy Disk in macOS. All right, here we are in a Linux VM. If I plug this in, 
while the Linux VM has focus, a special driver in VMware Fusion actually tries to kind of immediately grab the disk and attach it to the VM instead of to the uh, Mac OS drivers. This is actually a relatively recent UI feature. It's giving me a choice. So I can just immediately connect this to Linux, and now the Mac OS drivers never had a chance to get it. All right, so Linux is seeing the files on here as normal. All right, LSUSB, there it is. Huh, it shows up here as an MP3 player on Linux. In Linux, this, this particular list in Linux doesn't actually work by asking the device for a string. It works by querying a hard-coded database, which is a little bit grody. That is a strange serial number. I wonder if they just threw a binary thing in that string instead of actually formatting it properly, or if that's if that actually means something else. Yeah, I don't know if that's intentional or not. Okay, this, this make file kludge is probably not a great solution, but it works for now. So, yeah, we've got this uh, binary, which might actually work. So let's see if we can just use this as it was originally intended. No USB storage module. I plug this in. Now, I suspect at this point this auto-loaded. No? Can I, can Grumpy Disk see this? No, that's right, it takes a while for this thing to boot. Now the lights are on. Connect to Linux. Mm-hmm. Well, it's connected to Linux. All right, and I can successfully remove USB storage. Grumpy disk. All right. So it looks like Grumpy disk is now successfully reading back the disk image. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't really expect this to show us anything surprising. It should just be the normal stuff that you can see on the disk. I mean, this is all just normal file system-y stuff. All right, so this successfully reads stuff back. I'm not gonna bother reading back the whole thing because that would be really slow. That right there just read back 24 megabytes. So this thing is no speed demon. So here we found the main loop in Grumpy Disk. This is at the bottom of uh, main.c. And normally it just goes through in these batches of 512 sectors, reading them all or dying trying, apparently. So we want to keep this writing part, but change the order that this all happens in. So I think we just want to make another wrapper around this. And this seems all right so far. So now that we can read stuff that we're supposed to be able to read, let's see if we can read anything else. Right there, something happened and my audio interface uh, dropped off the USB. And so, you know, I lost the uh, the rest of the voiceover for that section, but nothing much happened. I just. Uh, kind of fruitlessly tried to make contact with this device again. So rather than plug my device under test into the same computer that I'm using for my voiceover recording, instead I have a, another separate little setup here with a Raspberry Pi 2 and a hardware USB analyzer so that we can uh, get a record of everything that goes back and forth between these two devices. So first I just want to replicate both the working and non-working tests from earlier on this new setup. Oh. I should be root. This time it is a root permission problem, I think. Oh. Hmm. So the drive isn't mounted. It's just that even having dev SDA exist means we have that USB storage driver um, kind of hogging the device we want to use. 
got this thing connected. I might as well see if I'm getting any traffic through. Oh, I guess, oh, that's interesting. I guess I'm see, I'm probably seeing data that's meant for the Wi-Fi device on the Raspberry Pi because I'm plugged into, um, so this, this analyzer is capturing everything that goes between these two ports. Um, but because the Raspberry Pi has a USB hub built in, uh, when the processor, you know, when the, when the, when the USB host controller built into the system on a chip is sending out a USB command intended for the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet controller, it's going to be sharing a USB uh, data pair between the hub and the system on a chip. And the, uh, the hub actually doesn't have to filter those out, and it looks like maybe that's what we're seeing. To test that theory, I'm going to see if I can send some noticeable plain text that we might be able to pick out in this listing. So one of these is probably the hub itself, and then uh, one is probably the Wi-Fi and one the Ethernet. I'm guessing that this one with a lot more bytes going to it is the Wi-Fi. We aren't seeing data that uh, the Wi-Fi adapter or the Ethernet sends back to the system on a chip, but we are seeing outgoing data that's meant for the Wi-Fi on all of the USB ports. Let's try sending some plain text out to the network. Oh, there it is. Plain text. So even though the USB sniffer is attached between these two devices, the hub is just happening to leak all of these packets that are actually intended for the Wi-Fi. So this, you know, this probably isn't a big deal since you're about to send all of that data over the radio anyway, but it's an interesting thing to note. So just to make this easier, I'm going to filter the USB analyzer. Yeah, with that filtered, it looks like somebody is polling the device, just kind of issuing USB uh, storage commands every so often. So maybe that's why we can't um, access it with Grumpy Disk. Oh, maybe this is a better route. So I wanted to get kind of lower level access since that seemed like it would be useful later, but at this point, it looks like to do that, I'd have to recompile the kernel without the USB storage driver, since it isn't a module in this case. And I think there might actually just be some command line tools for the SCSI generic layer in Linux that I can use for this. So if that works, I can skip grumpy disk entirely, actually. Ah, there we go. SG3 utils, I think, is the right package. Oh, am I just, is this a pebcac? Am I just using this wrong? Yay, SCSI generic. That seems right. Actions, USB flash disk. So, let's see if we can use SGDD to read things we shouldn't. They sure did really want this to look like DD. All right, this should be a small test reading the first 1,024 blocks from the beginning of the device. Some error occurred. That's weird. Is my block size too small, maybe? Whoa. Oh, man. That was a problem. That wasn't supposed to crash it yet. Oh, it's using 1024 byte blocks. <laughs> maybe I'll set that to match. Still some error occurred. Oh, that worked. Maybe this utility just doesn't split up large operations. How big can I make this without failing? All right, apparently I can read exactly 120 kilobytes from the beginning in one operation. Okay, I think that read looks fine. So we've got a read from the beginning using the SCSI generic tools. Cool. All right. Read capacity. So nice of them to give each SCSI command its own little program. All right, so this tells us what the device is shaped like as far as SCSI is concerned. Each block is one kilobyte, and this many blocks. 
And it looks like we can successfully read 120 blocks at a time using this SGDD thing, which should turn into a single um, SCSI read command. So just to make sure we know what this normally looks like, let's capture this on the USB analyzer. Show only this device. Great. So here's what happened. We've got this USB-C, which let's take a look at what that means. There's actually a new USB storage specification for USB 3, but the vast majority of devices are still using the old one. So if you're looking for this specification, the one you want is the uh, USB mass storage class bulk only transport. Mass storage class is the sort of general umbrella protocol for things that have a lot of bytes in them. You know, block devices, if you've heard of those. So USB storage is really easy to spot because of these uh, command and response signatures. So with this terminology, out always means from the computer host, whatever that is, to the USB device. So the USB mass storage protocol is really just a wrapper around SCSI. And in this document, you can see how they use these two headers, the CBW and CSW, to indicate just a little bit of metadata around the SCSI transaction. And these CBW and CSW packets are actually what start with this uh, signature, which is so easy to pick out in the hex dumps. So this USB-C here indicates the beginning of a command block wrapper, which begins a SCSI transfer. And in this case, it looks like it was another one of these polling commands that didn't really require much of a response. So we immediately get this USB-S uh, for status, indicating that the command is finished. Then this next out starts another SCSI command. So each SCSI command turns into one of these pairs of USB-C, then some optional data, and a USB-S. So my guess here is that the SG3 utilities might just automatically ask the device to identify itself before doing the operation we actually asked for. But this looks like the beginning of the actual read we asked for. So if we went through and decoded this as a SCSI command, we should see that it indicates a read. And then here's a bunch of data. This is obviously the beginning of the disk again. So already we're seeing this interesting mismatch between the lengths that all these different protocols have to deal with. Because this is USB 2, we can have 512 byte uh, data packets at the USB level. But then at the SCSI level, we have this much larger 120 kilobyte thing we're dealing with. So far, this seems like a pretty normal USB storage read. Okay, so we've got the analyzer logging in real time now. Here it's showing us the periodic polls that seem to be coming from some other program on the Raspberry Pi. So a single block read gets broken up into two of these 512 byte USB data packets plus the 31 and 13 byte uh, headers here. Let's try reading the very last block. That was uneventful. Let's try reading the block after the very last block. Doesn't look empty, but it's hard to tell if this is good data. That's interesting, it doesn't seem to work if I read 120, but if I read one maybe? This does seem to be letting me read something past the end of where the disk is supposed to end. And it seems different from block to block. Hmm. <laughs> All right, Binviz says this looks random. So I'm gonna guess this is just completely uninitialized memory of some sort. All right, can I read more at a time and still get a useful file? Uh, that's too much. So I'm reading 16 kilobytes of something, and then I start just hitting zeros after that. But if the read gets too big, then it just returns all zeros. So like if I read 64 kilobytes, then it returns all zeros. Yeah, if I ask this for slightly too much data, so if I ask it for 55 kilobytes, then it returns a bunch of stuff and then zeros. And if I ask it for 56 kilobytes, then it's all zeros. Let's see if this stuff is the same as if I ask it for 32 kilobytes. Seems like it. Hmm. That, uh, that's not too helpful. Like, I don't see any patterns, and neither does Binviz. Yeah, let's just try 32 for now. 
And can I change this if I just request a different address? Oh. Hey, that broke it entirely. So far, now look in reproducing the crash. Most of these addresses I've been trying just give me zeros. There's a little band of space after the partition that just seems to give me what looks to be completely random data. All right, enough with these uh, standard commands then. Let's see what that hardware DLL was sending. The thing I'm interested in is the CDB, which is the SCSI command, I forget what the D stands for, SCSI command something or other block, command descriptor block. That's actually the SCSI command proper. The rest of this is necessary for the transfer setup. Okay, so actually it looks like maybe this is the only device I/O control that refers to SCSI pass-through. Maybe I just got lucky the first time. So I tracked down the other device I.O. controls, and really, this routine here is doing something related to SCSI pass-through, but these others are all doing some other different things that have nothing to do with SCSI. So yeah, this seems to be something about drive letters, and a bunch of USB enumeration, walking through the USB hubs, yeah, something about disk volumes. But yeah, this subroutine seems to be the only place where we're actually doing SCSI pass-through, so that's kind of nice. Now that's interesting. So these D words here are the CDB. Then the CDB in this case is actually these four values. So data in is coming from this uh, structure in our arguments. Okay, so this is parsing apart an input structure. We could, at this point, uh, figure out the layout of the structure that's being passed into this function. That is really strange that we would be dealing with a pointer offset by such a weird number. That is odd. So there's some flags here. Hmm. Okay, well, I think we know where to find the CDB info where this is called. So let's see where the call sites are and what they look like. Lots of call sites. All right, great. Here's a much smaller case. I think this is it assembling the CDB or part of it. I mean, that's just sloppy. This is... This is all unaligned data. It's kind of gross. This is interesting. So this call site is making a SCSI pass-through command and then looking for this actions USBD string in the response. Are these characters? Aha! This probably isn't necessary, but maybe they're building a header for sending this uh, directly over USB storage, just in case. And then this should be the beginning of the CDB, I think. So I wonder if this is a real SCSI command. Well, if, if I'm actually looking at the right value here, this might indicate it's sending an obsolete seek command and then expecting a strange result. All right, let's start with their example just to make sure this is working. Oh, that's interesting. If I just give it a really long inquiry, it starts handing back a bunch of information I didn't ask for. That might be the next file name. Ha, this definitely looks like it's just handing back random RAM. There's the name of the processor. Well, it looks like I can read just under 64K from the inquiry response buffer. So I suspect this is just dumping out the entire RAM of the processor, which is great. Writing data to inquiry.bin. So let's see what that looks like now. So this probably started in the middle of some RAM bank or maybe in the middle of the stack. Something like that might be memory mapped IO. This looks like uninitialized RAM actually. All right, AK there, AK there. 
What is this? This is probably, probably was an 8K bank. I mean, I suspect I'm wrapping around somewhere. I've got to be wrapping around somewhere. Hmm, maybe this is file allocation table stuff. And there's the date, 2013. I guess that's when the firmware was compiled or written. Well, after looking through here, it does seem like we are getting some of the RAM banks, and maybe we are looking through this window into the external flash memory, but it's really not obvious to me how these map. So I think the next step is maybe just to load this into IDA and see if there's any code in here. Yeah, that doesn't look like code. That turned out differently than I had expected. So still no real leads on the uh, the custom commands, but a little closer to uncovering those, and found an unexpectedly easy way to get a bunch of contents of this device's RAM just kind of spewing out of a oversized SCSI inquiry. So I've been poking around in IDA and looking around, and there's some interesting structure in here for sure, but so far I don't see any actual Z80 code. So so far it looks like maybe this is only a portion of RAM, uh, maybe a portion that has some buffers, and maybe access to the bus where the flash memory is attached. So that seems like a good stopping point for this video, but please let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions for where else to take this. Also, if you'd like to take a look yourself at this binary file from the oversized inquiry, then totally download it and let me know if you find anything. Well, thanks for watching another hardware teardown reverse engineering sort of video. Uh, if you like that, then check out my other videos. You might like them too, and maybe even tell your friends about these. And uh, if you subscribe, you'll be the first to know when I release something new. Thanks, and uh, keep hacking.